I'm going to gather us back together, those of you happily talking. Welcome if you're just joining us, and welcome back if you're here for the afternoon. Um, I want to thank the North Chapel, which is the Unitarian Society of Woodstock, for this beautiful space, which for many years this has been the poetry home at Bookstock. I'm Jim Schley. I'd like to acknowledge Partridge Boswell, who planned this program and is one of the co-founders of Bookstock, but isn't here. The summer is in Ireland, and I'm the pinch hitter. Um, please silence your cell phones and other devices that might yawp at us, barbaric yawp. And uh, we've been asked by the church not to have food or drink other than water in here, so keep that in mind. There are restrooms straight through that door, straight through this door, two more down below um, if there's a rush. Um, Bookstock is supported by many organizations, and if you look in your program and you know a business person who's listed there as a sponsor, please tell them that you appreciate the support. I want to mention um, some inns which have, for some of the authors who've come from greater distances, have provided complimentary lodging. Ardmore Inn, Charleston House, Sleep Woodstock, Deerbrook Inn, Quality Inn in Quichi, Shire Woodstock, the Fan House in Barnard, and the Woodstocker B&B. And also thanks to our bookselling partner, the Yankee Bookstore, which is in the foyer, where um, the featured authors from this venue, um, you'll find their books and opportunity to sign. They are a staunchly independent bookstore, and we urge you to support them. You can do your browsing on Amazon, but then buy your book from the Yankee Bookstore instead of the reverse. Um, all the events this weekend are free. Um, thanks to our sponsors and some grants, um, but there is the Bookstock's traditional sap bucket here. Please feel welcome to put something in there. It will be put to get good use and not a penny will be wasted. And we, on the music stand, there's a sign-up sheet if you would like to give the organization your email and you'll get early notice of, of future events. Um, in this hour, we're going to have Matthew Oltzman and Rachel Hadas. Each will read for about 20 minutes. Um, there is a little break between the two while I introduce the second reader. And at the end, there'll be time to talk to the poets, and their books, as I mentioned, are in the hallway. Matthew Olsman was born in Detroit, Michigan. He received a BA from the University of Michigan in Dearborn and an MFA from Warren Wilson College. He is the author of two collections of poems, Contradictions in the Design, and mezzanines. And Matt teaches in, now in Warren Wilson's MFA program and at Dartmouth College. A characteristic Matt Oldsman poem moves by darts and leaps. Reading or listening to one stanza, you might say, oh, this is a poem about an hourglass. In the next stanza, you'd say it's about a stairway. Next, a car wreck, then a caterpillar, and then Graceland, Grant's tomb, and to quote directly, and whatever's left of the Parthenon. As if with a snap of the wrist, the poem comes together, and by the end, he has let loose a metaphorical chain reaction that reenacts the mind in striding motion. Along with being fierce, you'll find that Matt's poems are often very funny. Even the table of contents in his two books are frequently and unnervingly hilarious, with titles like Possum Drop, while scratching my wife's back, I calculate the distance between sky and earth. I'll forgive John Keats, but not you. It says something about me. I find these really funny. If you don't, bear with me. Man robs liquor store, leaves resume. I dare you to say that's not funny. The Department of Doubt, imaginary shotguns, and NASA video transmission picked up by baby monitor. You'll also learn new words from these poems. Check out chyloproclitic, an erotic attraction to lips. Matt Oldsman's poems are populated with sculptures and skulls, ancient edifices and the daily news. As what's familiar is seen askance, then what's inexplicable is ever so closely scrutinized. Hold on to your seats.
Welcome, Matthew Olsman. This is a poem from my most recent book. It's called The Man Who Was Mistaken. No, I'm not the associate dean for faculty teaching and learning. You're thinking of Gary Hawkins as what I told the second person this week who thought I was Gary. Gary who, like me, is bald and wears glasses. I, I wrote this before I like grew my hair long. Gary, who, like me, is bald and wears glasses. Gary, who once 10 years ago was mistaken in an airport for the musician Moby. Moby, who, like me, is bald and wears glasses. I am not Moby. I'm the man who was mistaken for the man who was mistaken for Moby. I'm okay with that distinction, just like I'm not Jesus, but in 1996, I went to it. I shared an apartment with a guy who would go to parties in Detroit and dance until his ankles bled. He came home once, talking not about Moby, but the idea of his music. I was trying to play a video game. It was Street Fighter, I think, and I was about to win the thing, which is when he said, you know that part in the song First Cool Hive where the music stops being music and starts being tongues of fire descending across the land? Which is when I said, no. Which is when he said, stop being cynical. I'm trying to say I had a spiritual experience, that the spirit was inside the music. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus, which is when I said, wait, you think Moby is actually Jesus? Which is when he said, I think we all are. Which is when my guy on the TV screen got his head kicked in and, and died. The game was over. I didn't know what he was talking about. But looking back, I realized that music and the spirit are fused, like that point on the horizon where you can't tell the earth from the sky from the smokestacks that ignite them both. Am I saying one face in the crowd could be any other face? Am I saying we're not all that different? Am I saying we are all connected? No. I'm saying my roommate ate a lot of drugs and would come home and say crazy things. Once he thought our furnace was talking to him, which is when I said, well, why don't you tell me what the furnace was trying to say? Which is when he said, it said that me and it would always be enemies. Which is when I said, son, that's a fight you can never win. Which is when he said, okay, then went outside to dance on the hood of his car, which is when the cops came. Perhaps he was right. Jesus was inside the music, and the music was inside my roommate and the state couldn't tolerate it, so they sent a couple officers to make him stop. What did the music tell him? It told him the world was on fire. He danced anyway. So many people in the world, and when they dance inside the pulse of smoke machines and strobe lights, I can't tell one from the next from the next. There's a word for the fear of being unable to distinguish yourself in a place like this. I'm not Jesus. I'm not Moby. I'm not Gary Hawkins. I'm the guy who looks like that other guy. Him. The one who has changed. The one who could be someone else. Um, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Jim for inviting me to do this and Bookstock for existing and uh, you guys for being here. Uh, this is a poem from my first book. It's called Mountain Dew Commercial Disguised as a Love Poem. So here's what I've got. The reasons why our marriage might work. Because you wear pink but write poems about bullets and gravestones. Because you yell at your keys when you lose them and laugh loudly at your own jokes. Because you memorize songs, even commercials from 30 years back and sing them when vacuuming. You have soft hands. Because when we moved, the contents of what you packed were written inside the boxes. Because you think swans are overrated and kind of stupid. Because you drove me to the train station. You drove me to Minneapolis. You drove me to Providence. Because you underline everything you read and circle the things that you think are important and put stars next to the things you think I should think are important and write notes in the margins about all the people you're mad at and my name almost never appears there. Because you made that pork recipe you found in the Frida Kahlo cookbook. Because when you read that essay about Rilke, you underlined the whole thing, except the part where Rilke says love means to deny the self and be consumed in flames. 
because when the lights are off, the curtains drawn, and an additional sheet is nailed over the windows, you still believe someone outside can somehow see you. And one day, five summers ago, when you couldn't put gas in your car, when your fridge was so empty, not even leftovers or condiments, there was a single 20-ounce bottle of Mountain Dew, which you paid for with your last damn dime, because you once overheard me say that I liked it. Uh, I'm going to mostly be reading some poems from uh, my next collection, uh, which will be out in a couple years, from Alice James. Uh, and it's a collection of, of mostly uh, epistolary poems, so letters or uh, weird poems about post offices. And uh, this is a letter to Bruce Wayne. A good place to hide a drop of water is a stream. A good place to hide a stream is beneath an ocean. A good place to hide a man is among thousands of other men. Watch how they rush through the city like water through a ravine. I've searched many famous cities for you. There are three listings for Bruce Wayne in Houston, two in Pittsburgh, one in Miami, one in LA. In Tampa, Bruce Wayne is a retired chemistry teacher. In Flagstaff, he drives a taxi and hopes to procure a diamond for his soon-to-be fiance. A good place to hide a star is a galaxy. A good place to hide a galaxy is a universe. Look at the night sky. Justice used to be a cowl and cape, the flicker of wings under an ateliated moon. And you, like a gargoyle, crouched atop some stone edifice. To conceal the universe, place it in a multiverse. That hypothetical clash of alternate realities. The dilemma of the word alternate is how it implies a norm, a progenitor stream from which the alternate diverges. Which is the alternate? Which is right here, right now? There is no such thing as Gotham City, but here is Gotham City, and I've been so naive, believing the truth of the old comic books, how they promised a recognizable villain, a clown with a ruby-slashed mouth, a lunatic's laugh. In the universe where I exist, supervillains look like everyone else. Give them an old flannel to wear and a square jawline to smile at the world, and suddenly they're hanging a noose in a middle school bathroom. They're shouting, get out of my country from the window of a passing car. They're pulling a revolver in a crowded bar room or bus stop or the middle of the street. They could be anywhere. They could be everywhere. A good place to hide a tyrant is a full-length mirror. A good place to hide that mirror is the heart of a well-populated area. In the battle of good versus evil, I was so sure that good would win. Now I just hope something good will survive. Get a job cutting hair, selling cars, make it home in time for dinner. I suspect there's a parallel dimension where you, dear vigilante, long for this as well. To have a normal life is victory enough to remain anonymous and not be spat upon on the subway. In Boston, Bruce Wayne owns a pawn shop. In Milwaukee, he plays pinochle and feeds stray cats. In New Hampshire, he goes fly fishing on the Sugar River, reels in one brook trout after another. When he removes the hook from a mouth, he might place the fish into a cooler, or he might, its, or he might set it back into a stream, watch as it swims far, far away. I found the water. Letter beginning with two lines from Cheswaf Miwosh. You whom I could not save, listen to me. Can we agree Kevlar? Backpacks shouldn't be needed for children walking to school. Those same children shouldn't also require a suit of armor when standing on their front lawns or snipers to watch their backs as they eat their lunches. They shouldn't have to stop to consider the speed of a bullet or how it might reshape their bodies, but one winter back in Detroit, I had one student who opened a door and died. It was the front door to his house, but it could have been any door. The bullet could have written any name. The shooter was 13 years old and aiming at someone else, but a bullet doesn't care about aim. It doesn't distinguish between the innocent and the innocent. And how is the bullet supposed to know this? Child would open the door at the exact wrong moment because his friend was outside and screaming for help, did I say? I had one student who opened a door and died. That's wrong. There were many. The classroom of grief 
had far more seats than the classroom for math, though every student in the classroom for math could count the names of their dead. A kid opens a door, a bullet couldn't possibly know, nor could the gun, because guns don't kill people. They don't have minds to decide these things. They don't choose or have a conscience. And when a man doesn't have a conscience, we call him a sociopath. This is how we know what type of assault rifle one can become and how we discover the hell that might thrum inside any of them. Today, there's another shooting and the dead are everywhere. It was a school, a movie theater, a parking lot. The world is full of doors and you, who we could not save, may open a door and enter a meadow or a eulogy. And if the latter, you will be mourned, then buried in rhetoric. There will be monuments of legislation, little flowers made from red tape. What should we do, we'll ask again. The earth will close like a door above you. What should we do? And that click you hear, that's just our voices, the deadbolt of discourse sliding into place. This is a prayer near Black Mountain, a farm in North Carolina, 1136 p.m. early May. Our Father who art in heaven and also the centipede grass and the creek and the engine that warbles roadside, thank you for the black silhouette of mountains and the deep black against the regular black of the night. Thank you for the field between me and them even though I can't see it, and thanks for the ability to imagine what can't be seen. I imagine you, just as these lowing cows must have faith in the field as they glide across it, seeing nothing out here but the outlines of each other, my headlights, an obliterated barn in the distance. I have three more poems. This is called My Invisible Horse and the Speed of Human Decency. People always tell me, don't put the cart before the horse, which is curious because I don't have a horse. Is this some new advancement in public shaming, repeatedly drawing one's attention to that which one is currently not and never has been in possession of? If ever I happen to obtain a Clydesdale, then I'll align absolutely it to its proper position in relation to the cart, but I can't do that because all I have is the cart, one solitary cart, a little grief wagon that goes precisely nowhere, along with, apparently, one invisible horse which does not pull, does not haul, does not in any fashion budge, impel, or tow my disaster buggy up the hill or down the road. I'm not asking for much, a more tender world with less hatred strutting through the streets, perhaps a downtick in state-sanctioned violence against civilians, wind through the trees, water under the bridge, kindness, LOL, says the world. These things take time, says the office of disappointment. Change cannot be rushed, says the round table of my smartest friends. Then together, they all say, the cart. They say, the horse. They say, haven't we told you this already? And so, my invisible horse remains standing where it previously stood, between hot dog stands and hallelujahs, between the Nasdaq and the moon's adumbral visage, between the status quo and the great filter. And I can see that it's not my horse's fault, being invisible and not existing, how he's the product of both my imagination and the greater good's failure of imagination. Watch as I press my hand against his translucent flank, how I hold two sugar cubes to his hypothetical mouth, how I say I want to believe in him, speaking softly into his missing ear. This is a, a, letter while, a letter written while waiting in line at Comic-Con. Klingon, Parseltongue, Navi. People invent imaginary languages, so imaginary citizens of imaginary worlds can speak to one another. Elvish, Ewokese, Dothraki. 
You can learn these languages. Come to a convention with your face painted blue or a leather scabbard bolted to your back and talk to people who will understand you. I understand what language feels like when you're not understood. More than once, I thought some other planet might be my home. Last week, in an alley, I saw one man punch another until neither looked like a person. There are hundreds of reasons like this, to long to be from some other galaxy, century, or dimension. Reasons to put on a spacesuit or wizard's cloak and hope no one will recognize you. But it's not these costumes that amaze me. It's always been the languages, the way they reach for something that can't be said in our tongue. In the only language I know, there are not enough words for parabola or isotope, too few phrases to say I'm sorry or I'm glad that I found you. Though we've been married for years, I wish we met when we were children. If we had known each other in the year you spent alone on earth without one friend, we could have been aliens together. I'd have those green four-fingered hands, you with your glow-in-the-dark antennae, words in the form of strange whirling noises, low chirping machine music, wisps of static, lamentations of rain. Only you and I would know what these sounds meant. My, my wife, who, who you'll hear, uh, Vivi, who you'll hear read later today, she's always t saying, your best poems are all about me. You should write more poems about me. But then when I read them, she's like, you should stop reading poems about me. So, um, this is the last poem I'm going to read. Thank you guys for listening. This is a, a letter to the person who, during the Q&A session after the reading, asked for career advice. The confusion you feel is not your fault. When we were younger, guidance counselors steered us toward respectable occupations. Doctor, lawyer, pharmacist, dentist. Not once did they say exorcist, snake milker, or race car helmet tester. Always investment banker, IT specialist, marketing, marketing associate. Never, you should be a rodeo clown. Never air guitar soloist, chainsaw juggler, or miniature golf windmill maker. In this country, in the year I was born, some 3.1 million other people were also born, each with their own destiny, the lines of their palms predicting an incandescent future. Were all of them supposed to be strategy consultants and commodity analysts? Water slide companies pay people to slide down water slides to evaluate their product. Somehow, that is an actual legit job. So is the naming of nail polish colors. Were either of these presented as options? You need to follow your passion as long as your passion is not a sustina and is definitely a hedge fund. If I could do it over, I'd suggest an entry-level position standing by a riverbank or a middle management opportunity winding like fog through the sugar maples of New England. There's a catastrophic shortage of bagpipe players, tombstone sculptors, and tightrope walkers. When they tell you about the road ahead, they forget the quadrillion other roads. You'll know which one belongs to you because it fills you with astonishment or ends with you being reborn as an alpine ibex, a gravity-defying goat, able to leap seven feet in the air, find footholds where none exist, and without imagining it could ever be anything else, scale a vertical sheet of solid rock to find some branches, twigs, or wild berries to devour. Thank you. I like to think of Rachel Hadas as a migratory bird who lives in more than one place, both in New York City, while she's teaching at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and in Danville, Vermont, where she's been a seasonal denizen for many years. She's also a world traveler and the author of more than two dozen books so far, collections of poems, essays, translations of poetry and drama from multiple languages. She translated from French one of Paul Verlaine's poems in eighth grade. She has written a gorgeous and difficult memoir called Strange Relation about losing a spouse to dementia 
an experience also encompassed by poems in her 2012 book, The Golden Road. Let's consider the idea of the classical and classicism. In classical painting and sculpture, for example, in Greek and Roman antiqu antiquity, or among the neoclassical European artists, artists of the Renaissance, we found, find encounters between mortal people and gods, monsters, creatures that can metamorphose between these states and registers. And you'll also find the impending presence of the mythic supernatural in Ra Rachel Hadass's poems, often combined inseparably, inseparably with episodes of domesticity and ordinary worldly life. These poems are filled, too, with the incidents and encounters we recognize as everyday, yet transformed from incidental to mythic in impact. This is a poet who is profoundly learned, but who transmutes her erudition with a light touch, delicate, insistent. I know you'll recognize another, another aspect of classicism in the fluency with formal techniques that is very apparent in Rachel's poetry, supple, pivotal rhymes, metrical rhythms, compression and phrasing, which create pressure, a tension between intellectual restraint and unsuppressible power of emotions. Welcome, Rachel Hattis. I hope you can hear me between the mics. I'm tempted to say, come forward in your pews, but I think people want to be where they are. But let me know if you can't hear me. Thank you for a beautiful introduction, Jim, and for an enormously smart and entertaining reading, Matthew. You make me feel very old and slow. So, but um, I, my son is just at Warren Wilson right now. We can talk about uh, studying fiction. So, um, so I'm going to read eight poems so we know where we are. And the first one is a love poem to my husband who's in near the back row and it's a sonnet. And the first two poems I'm going to read are set in Vermont. And I think it's no coincidence that they're among the more cheerful poems I'm going to read. I like the idea of being a migratory bird. So this is called Equipoise. Um, Garrett Kieser had a wonderful line about an apple tree, but I don't remember which poem it was, but this is, I would say, late August. Equipoise. Early light slants low across the lawn. Cup-like, this little valley brims with sun. Pages fill and empty. In the midst of a still morning, nothing's out of reach. Decades fade, the past glides into range, recoverable, a pristine cobweb caught motionless in one slap of morning light. You're on your daily walk, uphill and back. Summer's end balances autumn's start. One apple falls without a breath of wind, but fruit past countings hidden in the tall wet grass. Like this valley now, my heart is full. I start to climb the hill toward you. My soul flies out to greet you, coming down. One patient person in the audience heard me read in Brownington only a few days ago, but this is a poem I did not read in Brownington. Um, this is about a, a past summer. It's an interesting temporal experience to come back to the same place year after year, but only part of the year. I guess that's how birds feel. And also, this is a memory of something I did with my mother or she with me many years ago. My mother's been dead for many years, and if anyone in the audience needs reminding that it's worth spending time with a child, it is worth spending time with a child. So this is called The Trick. I thought of it the other day a book my mother made with me. We pressed wildflowers and fastened them to pages marked with each flower's name in my staggering child's script. The daisy and buttercup we scotch taped and black-eyed Susan and Queen Anne's lace, devil's paintbrush, cinquefoil. I think that I could name them all. Their dewy gold, though turned to dust powdering the brittle page, then lost to years that fade and dull and dry, 
is vivid still in the mind's eye, which is the eye with which I look at that bulging little book. I see its pages, I ease green, though I won't see the book again. Time in its passage helps me see the law of mutability apply its riddling decree. What's perish perishable, fragile, lost may be precisely what will last. This one small notebook, QED, can hold the wealth of summers past because all summers disappear. Buttercups, daisies, that July, my mother's presence, where are they? Gone with the snows of yesteryear, gone where they can't be taken away. The treasures of metonymy, the riches of synecdoche, their elegant economy, their magical recovery, which captures a contingency and stores a golden memory into a perfect private place which never takes up any space. This is the trick of poetry. Um, Jim spoke very generously about the classical aspect of my work, and this is from my 2018 book, Poems for Camilla, um, a book written in early 2017 when the political landscape looked dark, it still looks dark, and Matthew wrote beautifully about that. Camilla is a character in Virgil's Aeneid, but we rarely read the second half of the Aeneid in high school. We read, if we read Latin, we read some of Aeneas's adventures leaving Troy, but when he arrives in Italy, there's a civil war. It's very dark and gets even darker. Camilla is a native princess who actually comes to a bad end. We have a granddaughter named Camilla, who I hope will not come to a bad end. But the way this book works is just that every poem has an epigraph from Virgil's Aeneid. Virgil was a tremendously powerful lyric poet who kind of stretched himself into writing epic, which he was not so well suited for, so I like to quote a few lines at a time. Um, in book nine of the Aeneid, two warriors about to go into battle are having a short conversation. They're also lovers, and one of them survives and one does not. And one of them says to the other, I'm just translating quickly, are the gods putting this desire for glory in our heads or does everybody's wish become a god to him? Good question, right? So this is called the source of thoughts. Tell me, do the gods implant this ardor in our minds? Is it an add-on or flip it? Maybe we ourselves attribute to the gods our heart's dear, direst wishes. Or take it one step further, could it be that what we wish becomes a god to us? Do things work outside in or inside out, top down or bottom up? The passage I have fixed on, did it fly from some high dusty shelf, some mottled page straight into my mind? Or did I rather, happening to revisit the second half of the Aeneid for the first time in more than 50 years, pluck the waiting words fresh from the page like immemorial fruit? Or, on the third hand, did my own fears and wishes conjure up the passage? Oh, my beloved, where do thoughts come from? Um, this is from a collection I'm working on. I have two collections I'm preparing now um, called Ghost Guest, Guest, G-U-E-S-T. And I don't know how many people in, the, in our beautiful space here are familiar with Marie Kondo's global bestseller, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Yes. Do people need that in Vermont? <laughs> um, because I feel as we in this rich country, as we get older, most of us are burdened by too many possessions. So this is a little meditation on that. I don't mention Marie Kondo, I just mentioned her to put it in perspective, but the epigraph is from the Tao Te Ching, uh, and the best translation I know of that important book, not that I know Chinese, is 
by Ursula Le Guin. I don't know how many people know that she did a terrific translation of the Tao Te Ching and her characteristic tartness gets into the epigraph. So this is verse 44. The poem is called Piece by Piece. And the epigraph, all you grasp will be thrown away. All you hoard will be utterly lost. I've practiced the poetics of space, but there's a sequel. Empty spaces have a resounding poetry. I'm standing, skimming through the bees. On the shelf near Bachelard, Keith Basso, wisdom sits in places, sits in empty places. While it's easy, study the hard. We've heard about the art of losing. Passing on is also choosing. Things are in motion, fast or slow. Clouds keep sailing through the sky. Holding on makes nothing stay. Give things permission to go. Touch with gentleness, release, and rooted objects will break loose. A landslide that gathers speed and leaves a brightness in its wake. A lacy layer of memories like foam lines scribbled on a beach. This was Vermont, and here was Greece. For the time left, what do I need? What to take, what not to take? Little by little, page by page, let me give myself away. Each addition to one's age asks for subtraction. It is time to be packing, travel light. What is the final appetite? What is there I will not let go? This poem is forthcoming in Gettysburg Review, and the editor was a very severe, very good editor, and he kept saying, cut this line, cut that line. So I had to obey him and let, let things go. Um, Keith Basso's book, Wisdom Sits in Places, is about Western Apache place names. It's a highly economical system, so you could say to somebody, where the oak tree stands by the river, and they would know exactly what story you had in mind. It's a very minimalist form of language. The remaining three poems um, are all from another collection in preparation called Love and Dread. And I would say that Matthew and a lot of poets who are writing now, including me, including Garrett Keyser, are writing about love and dread. Love is the human scale of our lives, if we're lucky, and dread is the more public terrifying realm that we feel we don't have much control over. Garrett Keyser had a couple of lines I scribbled down. Um, the milk of human kindness glistens on the nipple of catastrophe. So that you get that in one sentence, the milk of human kindness and catastrophe. So this is a poem called Shouldering, as in shouldering a burden. Uh, and it's a dream poem. I use dreams a fair amount and I, there are quotations from something I heard in a dream, more or less, so I'll put my fingers up for that. This poem is from last summer when the news came through of some of what was going on on our borders in this country. Shouldering. The dream bird father sitting on my shoulder is singing in my ear. Now that you're older than I was when I left the rocky road, it is your turn to shoulder the load. Answer questions students need to ask. You are an elder now. You wear the mask of wisdom, so you tell them. Tell them what? The song breaks off. In somebody's back seat, a baby. Whose? More babies on the border. Terror, desperation, rage, disorder of crowded house, tap leaking, family, students leaning in to question me. Where should we go now? Tell us what to do. The road's uphill, and that is all I know. Borrowing, burrowing, stirring the dark stew, blended broth of night visions and day. Instructions garbled, watchmen standing tall and menacing at gates along a wall. Gaps in the rampart, raw red border zone. Children wake and cry along the line. The students' questions pound relentlessly, Dream father, bird of omen, oh tell me, the lost, the hungry, the abandoned, who will take care of them? The grown-ups knew the answers to these questions, and now we are grown up, whose job is it to know? The reassuring elders, where are they? 
The dream bird looks at me and hops away, always uphill, the steep road, poetry, scattered syllables still in my ear when I sit up and the red world is here. Two more poems. Um, this is the title poem of Love and Dread. A desiccated daffodil, a pigeon cooing on the sill. The old cat lives on love and water. Your mother's balanced by your daughter. One faces death, one will give birth. The fulcrum is our life on earth, beginning, ending in a bed. We have to marry love and dread. Dark clouds are roiling in the sky. The daily drumbeat of the lie, steady, no crescendoing. This premature deceptive spring for Scythia's in bloom already. The challenge, balance, keep it steady. Now sniffing daffodils aroma, now Googling a rare sarcoma. The ghost cat's weightless on my lap. My mother's ghost floats through my nap as dearest heart we lie in bed. Oh, we must marry love and dread, must shield our sense from the glare and clamor of chaos everywhere. Life bestows gifts past expectation. It's time to plan a celebration, dance at the wedding, drink and sing, certain that summer follows spring. The baby is the youngest guest as new life blossoms from the past. But just how long can we depend on a recurrence without end? Everything changes, even change. The tapestry of seasons strangely stirs in an uneasy wind that teases dreamlike through the mind. I reach for you across the bed. Oh, how to marry love and dread. And this is sort of a variant on the same theme. It's called a poultice, as in applying a poultice to a wound. And there are several strands in the poem that you'll notice coming back. One of them is an herbal poultice. My son is an herbalist and recommends things when I have something wrong with me. And in this case, it was just a bruise. Um, public events, those scary public events, private love. And in New York City, this is from the other part of my life, um, Hamilton Grange is the farmhouse that Alexander Hamilton built to be his country house, which is now in Harlem, somewhere around 140th Street in New York. It's certainly not in the country now. And Hamilton did not live to retire to Hamilton Grange. I wrote this before the musical made us all so familiar with Hamilton. So this is the last poem, A Poultice. Turmeric, rosemary, blend with rum. Winter is fading, spring will come, snow will melt and leaves set in. Rosemary, turmeric, shake in gin. Turmeric, bourbon, rosemary, a blue-green bruise leaks toward my eye. A week ago, I bumped my head. I swab and bathe it. The bruise will fade faster with this concoction recommended by my son. Soak a cloth and wipe the place. Weapons are poised to fight in space. Refugees packed in lifeboats drown. Cyber attacks, the system's down, an outage no one can repair. The turmeric has stained my hair. The pillow smells of alcohol. Wind and rain and petals fall. Sunday excursion, Hamilton Grange, the empty streets subdued and strange, the widowed house perched in its park, white petals gleam in the gathering dark. April this year is cool and slow, the stain seeps toward my left eyebrow. Care for the hurt place, soak, swab, wrap, and then before I take a nap, dab the spot with oil of myrrh, the poultice, patience, and desire. Turmeric, rosemary, and rum, 
My love and I are rocked in time. The motion lulls us. We forget the bruise, the wound, the doom, the threat. Thank you very much. <laughs>